Hi, everyone. Welcome to online lecture three um, for um, Psi 602. Um, so I want to start off by telling you a little bit about the reading, the homework, and then I'll tell you what we're going to be discussing today. Okay. So first, the reading. Okay. Um, is chapters eight and nine, research design and experimental research design. And I have this kind of cutesy article, but it really makes a really good um, point with respect to research design that I'd like you to look at. I'm just calling it the French fries article. Um, it's actually really well done. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, so that'll be posted on D2L for you. And then for homework, I'm asking you to actually read and evaluate this article by Sherman Haidt Cohn, 2009. Um, and I have some instructions on the final slide that I'll go through with you once we get there. And that'll be due, of course, next Wednesday, 217 by 9 a.m. Okay. All right. So, um, what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking a fair amount about sampling. Okay, I know this again might be, some of it might be review, some of it probably will be a little new, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, and then we'll also talk just a little bit about power. And then we will change gears and talk about randomized clinical trials or RCTs. Okay, so those will be our big topics for today. So let's get started. Sampling, as you know, is the process of selecting units from a population of interest. Now, most often people, groups, and organizations, but sometimes texts like diaries, internet discussion boards, and blogs, or even graphic images. Okay, so, so our population can be really anything and we want to sample from it, okay? So by studying the sample, we hope that we can generalize results to the population from which the units were chosen. It's as simple as that, right? We often do not have the time, resources, um, or ability to study the whole population. So what do we do? We draw a sample, we study the sample. Be it typical like people or atypical like graphic images, and we draw conclusions about, hopefully, the population. We're going to talk about that today. All right. So let's start off with some sampling terminology. Um, so we have the theoretical population. This is the group to which ideally you would like to sample from. However, the accessible population is the population to which you can get access to when sampling. Okay, so I might want to generalize to everybody in the United States, or let's say all adults in the United States. Um, but who can I actually get access to? Maybe only those adults in the United States with a phone number, which may not be everybody. Okay. And then the sampling frame is the list from which you draw the sample. Now, in some cases, there may be no list. You draw your sample based upon an explicit rule. So if you remember quota sampling, um, when you're trying to get a certain number of people or certain number of, of whatever you're sampling, um, perhaps in different categories. Um, so let's say you're doing quota sampling of passers by at a local mall. You do not have a list per se. Um, but the sampling frame is the population of people who pass by within the time frame of your study and the rules you're using to decide whom to select. Okay. So that's your sampling frame. And then finally, your sample is the actual units you select to participate in your study. So again, theoretical population, that's who I want to generalize to compared to the accessible or actual study population, that's the one to whom I can get access. Sampling frame is that, that list from which I draw my sample or maybe not even a list. And then of course the sample is the actual, actual persons or units or what have you that are in the study. All right. 
Let's survey a representative group of male ages 13 to 17 with incomes over 13 million that refuse to change their hairstyle. I don't think that'll be a problem. So um, it's uh, not the most current uh, cartoon, but I thought you might like it. Okay, if you don't like it, I apologize. But, um, you know, we have to be careful when we define our sampling frame or when we define even our, our population, how we want to restrict that. Okay. So once again, the accessible population is that group you can get access to when sampling, usually contrasted with the theoretical population. All right, so bias. Bias is a systematic error in an estimate. It can be the result of any factor that leads to an incorrect estimate and can lead to a result that does not represent the true value in the population. So I know bias has this negative connotation to it, um, but really it, it doesn't have to be intentional. It doesn't even have to happen because um, you did something wrong. Um, it could just occur because luck wasn't kind. And even though you drew a sample using all the respected methods, um, you still got a bias sample. You still got a sample on one side, not from the center of the normal curve, but off to the side. Okay. All right. Generalizing, again, the process of making an inference that the results observed in the sample would hold in the population of interest. If such an inference or conclusion is valid, we can say that it has generalizability. Okay, so that's kind of something we've talked about. We, we kind of know about that. Now, external validity goes right along with this area, and I'll tell you why. Because it's the degree to which the conclusions in your study would hold for other persons, other places, other times. You see, it's, it's how well can we generalize? How far away from what we study can we actually generalize to? How, how much validity is there in that? Okay. So let's think about this. Um, two major approaches to external validity sampling. One is the sampling model. Okay. So here we draw, we have our population. That's everybody. We draw our sample, right? Look inside the uh, dash lines, draw the sample. And then we want to generalize back but the thing is, we can't necessarily generalize back to everyone. You generalize back to your results that, to, you generalize back to the population that makes sense based on how you drew the sample. Okay. So um, what do I mean by that? Like, for example, let's say we chose this pot, we have this population, this population has, uh, all different sorts of races and ethnicities, including Native American. In our sample, we didn't draw any Native Americans. When we generalize back, we should not generalize back to Native Americans because they we don't really have any data pertaining to them. Okay, and you see how that works? Okay. All right. Um, so this is the proximal similarity model. I kind of like this model um, because what it says is that when you want to generalize from your study to other contexts based upon the degree to which the other context is similar to your study context, right? So let's say you were doing a study um, about weather and mood. Does the weather impact mood? Um, and maybe you are in particular looking at uh, people who, um, whether light therapy might help some people out, okay? Um, so you're looking at people with maybe a, a seasonal affective disorder or something like that, and you wanna see if light therapy might help. Now, let's say you chose to do your study in Seattle. Seattle, Washington. Okay, so we happen to know that this is a very rainy area. We don't necessarily see the sun a whole bunch of the time. 
And let's say then you want to generalize your study to a different location. Might not be fair to generalize it to San Diego, California, which is a very sunny area. And um, maybe they don't need as much light therapy there. Maybe it wouldn't be as helpful there. But if you had another area that was maybe even further away in distance, but closer in terms of climate, you might have more luck generalizing there. So when you think of this, this gradient of similarity, which is the dimension along which your study context being related to other potential contexts in which you hope to generalize, think about what's important there. So when I want to generalize to other places, to other settings, to other times, to other people, what's close by, what's pretty similar, and what's pretty distant, and what makes sense to generalize to and what doesn't. Okay. Okay, so here we are back to some familiar topics, non-probability sampling, sampling that does not involve random selection, and probability sampling, sampling that does involve random selection. Now, you notice I've talked about random selection and I've talked about external validity. Those two are very attached. Uh, typically, random selection, if you can involve that in your study, tends to help out your external validity. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, now, random assignment, on the other hand, tends to be more linked to internal validity. And we're, we're going to talk more about random assignment later on when we get to those uh, randomized control trials. But for now, we're talking about selection, how that happens, random or not random. So if we're talking about non-probability sampling where we do not have random selection, and remember, random selection is a process or procedure that assures that the different units in your population are selected by chance. Does not 100% protect you from bias, but it sure helps, okay? So there's two kinds of non-probability sampling, accidental and purposive. Accidental, think of the haphazard or convenient sampling that we talked about. You can ask for volunteers. You might use whoever's available, such as college students. You might interview people on the street. And the problem is you don't know if your sample represents the population of interest, okay? It's convenient, but it may not be perfect in terms of external validity. Now, again, I, I don't want to demonize this. I just want to point out that this, if you're going to do this kind of sampling, you may have this kind of issue. Okay. okay. Um, sorry, I went backwards instead of forwards. Okay, now let's talk about purpose of sampling. So there's several types of purpose of sampling we can talk about. Modal instance sampling. Sampling for the most, that's sampling for the most typical case. Okay. Expert sampling is when you want to get a sample of people with known or demonstrable experience and expertise in some area. So sometimes that's important, right? You, you need a certain level of expertise. Um, that one I think sometimes trips people up. So let me try and give you an example. Uh, let's say you were looking at a study that wanted to see um, if a certain diagnosis in the DSM-5 would um, hold up, would it be, um, or would it be potentially confused with another DSM-5 di diagnosis, okay? So you might have a group of psychologists diagnosed based on some cases you put together, maybe you use some actors, maybe you just use some case scenarios. And the point being is how are you gonna sample those psychologists? And again, part of it is expert sampling. You need to sample from a group who has a certain level of expertise, okay? All right, quota sampling, which is one we, I know we've talked about before, but just to remind you, 
Um, it's any sampling method where you sample until you achieve a specific number of sampled units for each subgroup of a population. Okay. So I need this many Republicans and this many Democrats, for example. Okay. Proportional quota sampling. Um, there, when you're doing it, you want the proportions in each group to be the same. Whereas non-proportional, the proportions in each group are not the same. That's all. Okay. Heterogeneity sampling is sampling for diversity or variety. Okay. Kind of in contrast a little bit to our modal instance sampling. And snowball sampling, another one we talked about before, where um, you sample where your sample participants are based upon referral from prior participants. So again, if you were trying to look at um, a quality of life in uh, cancer patients of a specific kind of rare cancer, then once you got one patient, you might use them to help you link to other patients. Maybe they're all in a Facebook group together or maybe that patient can refer you to the doctor that, that's overseeing their care um, so that that doctor can help you get some other people to be in your study. Um, now, respondent-driven sampling is a new concept um, for us, and it combines um, that, that snowball sampling with a mathematical system of weighting the sample to compensate for it not having been drawn as a simple random sample. So basically, um, I don't know if you can really compensate for this sort of thing, but people try all the time. Um, people try to come up with ways to deal with the fact that sometimes we can't draw perfect samples, you know? And so, so this is one method to do that, okay? So, what, what, just let's review these basic terms here. We have a variable um, and then we have a particular response for a given variable. Someone says four on a particular variable. The statistic refers to the average perhaps that's estimated from the data. Whereas the parameter, and it really probably should say population parameter, because you can have a parameter for a sample or for a population. But in this case, the parameter is a population parameter. And this is the mean or average you would obtain if you were to complete this for the whole population. Okay, so again, uh, if we look at this, if our parameter is 3.72, but in our sample, we got 3.75 for our average, or we'll assume it's a mean. Um, that's not, that's, well, depending on what the whole range is, that may not be too bad. Um, and that's our error right there. The difference between what we get 3.75 and what we would have gotten, but we probably never know, 3.72, that, that's an error, okay. All right, so this is our our um, our normal curve again, and the notion here that we're talking about is um, what if we drew an infinite number of samples, okay, and we plotted the average for each sample on a curve, okay. So here's our sample. Here's one sample. Here's all the data. We take the average, plot. Here's another sample. Plot all the data, get the average, plot. Do the same thing here, plot. And if we did this an infinite number of times, or at least many, 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 many times, when we plotted all those means, we would get, under certain rules, a normal distribution. Okay. And that was what we referred to last semester as the, um, the central limit theorem, right? So this is a sampling distribution of means and the central limit theorem suggests that uh, most times if either our underlying distribution was normal or if our sample size for each of these is at least 30, this will be normal, 
Okay. Okay. So why do we care? <laughs> because that helps us give, a, give us a sense for um, being able to actually use the statistics that allow us to draw inferences from our sample to our population. That's the underlying need of it. Okay. So um, standard deviation is, um, they measure dispersion and uh, standard deviation is a little more helpful than variance because it says the, it uses the same units as the original measure. Okay. So it's very meaningful. Okay, so it's average amount of distance from the mean. That's how you can think of it. Whereas standard error is the spread of the averages around the average of averages in the sampling distribution. Okay, so that's um, that's kind of a mouthful there. How do I say this otherwise? Um, basically, what you're looking at is, let me go back a slide. If you're looking at this and you looked at the standard deviation for this, which is just remember all averages from a whole bunch of different samples, that's, that's your, your standard deviation in this is your standard error. Okay. And then finally, your sampling error. It's the error in measurement associated with sampling. So remember that difference we were talking about a couple of slides back between 3.75 and 3.72? Sampling error. Okay. Okay. All right. So here's our normal curve um, once again. And if you remember, um, the way it works is that we're going to first of all look at the mean and the standard deviation. This distribution has a mean of 3.75 and a standard deviation of 0.25. So here's our mean, should be right towards the center of the distribution. And we're seeing standard deviation of 0.25. So if we subtract 0.25 and add 0.25 to 3.75, we're between 3.5 and 4.0. That's where about 68% of the cases fall. 95% of the cases fall between 3.25 and 4.25. And 99% of the cases fall between 3.0 and 4.5. So each time what I'm doing is I'm taking 0.25 and adding it on both sides, okay? So that should make a little bit of intuitive sense. So if we go between uh, 3.5 and 4.0, that's one standard deviation out. You get about 68% of people, a little more than two thirds. Go another standard deviation out on both sides. You got about 95% and here you get about 99% of people. Okay. Okay. So um, let's assume that capital N is the number of cases in the sampling frame and lowercase n is the number of cases in the sample. Well, there's a whole bunch of different ways you might have chosen your sample from your sampling frame. Right? So let's just for fun say that there were 100 people in your sampling frame and you chose 10. What we're looking at here is what is the number of combinations that we could choose 10 people from 100? We could choose 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Right? It could just come out, even if we randomly do it, it could come out to be 1 to 10. It could be 1, 41, 51, 62, 73. You get my point, right? There's a whole bunch of different combinations or subsets of n, little n from big N. And we can also think of little n over big N as the sampling fraction, um, which is another, say of, another way of saying, what percent did we sample? 10 over 100, 10% or 0.10. 
And don't worry, we won't actually figure out the number of combinations or anything like that. It's just interesting to think about. Okay. So let's do just a really kind of brief review of the different kinds of sampling. Simple random sampling. We have our list that we choose from um, and we just, you know, close our eyes, put all the names in a bag and randomly choose the number of names that we have decided to include in our sample. And here we have this blindfolded guy saying, you, 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 you. I can't hear you, is it still random? Okay. Stratified random sampling. Now we want to be careful that we um, go ahead and choose a proportional random sample of these different races here. So first we take everyone and split them into these three groups. So imagine this original list is a lot longer, okay? And we split them into these three groups. Now what we're gonna do is pull from these three groups a proportional random, no a proportional random number of people. So in other words, let's say this was our largest group that had 50% of people and this only had 25%, this only had 25%, then we would pull 50% here, 25 and 25. So if in the population of 100 people, we had 50, 25, 25, and now we wanna pull 20 people, let's see if this math works out, then I wanna pull 10, five, and five. Okay. Systematic random sampling. Um, this kind of goes through a little bit of a procedure of how to do it, and that's fine. Um, it kind of ensures that, that it works out pretty decently, but it basically says, first of all, how many do you have to start with? We have 100, okay? Uh, what's our sample size? 20. What's going to be our interval size? Well, 100 divided by 20 gives you five. And then we have to select a random number between one and five to start with. We'll start with four. Select every fifth unit starting with four. Four plus five is nine, plus five is 14. That's how we do it. Okay. And then cluster or area random sampling. Uh, well, let's use another COVID example. Um, let's say that we are looking at all of the counties within a particular state, and um, we want to find out um, how people are coping with COVID. Um, so we want to give a survey, but you know, if we just chose randomly, we'd be traveling all over the state. It's not realistic. So instead, we're just going to choose certain counties. We're going to choose five counties, it looks like. And from those five counties, our goal is going to be to survey everyone in those counties and ask them how they're coping or give them whatever measure we're going to do to measure coping with COVID at this time. Okay. So, um, it just makes more sense in this case to only to look at people that are much closer together because of time, because of resources. And our assumption would be that if I test these counties, it will generalize to the whole state. So I'm assuming all my counties are equal. Now that may be a very bad assumption in this case, but that's that's the assumption for cluster or area random sampling. Okay. Then uh, there's multi-state sampling where you combine several sampling techniques to create a more efficient or more effective sample than the use of any sampling technique can achieve on its own. So um, let's say I do, um, stratified sampling to separate my groups. 
And then rather than following up with simple random sampling, maybe I do a systematic sample or something like that. It, it, it's basically, um, or I might do the simple sampling from there and then do a systematic after that. Or maybe I do my simple random sampling from my stratified. And then on top of that, then look at clusters where people are located within census blocks and do that. Any reasonable way of, of combining different sampling techniques. Okay. Okay, so let's now remind ourselves a little bit about power. And the reason I want to talk about this topic is I, I know that um, for dissertations, uh, there is a requirement of a power analysis. So I think it's helpful to bring it back into memory. Um, so what is power? It's the probability of correctly rejecting the null hypothesis. Or said another way, it's the probability of correctly saying the experimental condition produced an effect. Okay, the experimental condition produced an effect. So we typically like to have a power of 0.80, which means we're correctly reject a false null at least 80% of the time. That's very nice, that's a gold standard. We don't always achieve that and, and we can't always achieve that. Factors that influence power, sample size. As sample increases, power increases. But so does the time and money required to complete the research. As alpha increases, power increases. But we really don't like to mess with alpha. We like to keep alpha 0.05 or lower, okay? So we don't like to move that alpha up. Now, um, I may have shared this already, but there's something called compromise power analysis or, um, Basically, what you do is you do increase your alpha um, to get your power a little higher. And um, the idea of when you do this would be, well, when type 1 and type 2 errors are equally as poor, equally poor outcomes, right? So then if they're, if they're both really um, bad outcomes, you might, you might go ahead and, and do a compromise power analysis. And finally, the effect size, remember, is the magnitude um, or the size of the relationship between two variables in a population. And as effect size increases, power increases. But we know, as we said, typically the most practical way to increase power is to increase sample size because effect size is very difficult to move. It's hard to move that one. And alpha typically even though you can find articles out there about compromise analysis and all kinds of other interesting arguments, people don't like to mess with alpha, so you're stuck with sample size. Okay. Um, so people typically conduct a power analysis to estimate their sample size, and uh, software programs are typically used these days. Uh, there's two free options. There is the G power and the power and sample size calculation one. Um, SPSS does have kind of a nice third option, but I don't think it comes along with the version that, that is available to students who purchase it. Um, but these two are both free, nice, nice options for conducting power analysis. Okay. So how big should the sample be? Well, typically bigger is better, but um, because it increases the confidence in the results. Um, sometimes I get the question, um, can it get too large? And the answer is yes. We typically don't deal with this problem in psychology, but if you're getting up in the millions, it can be a problem because everything comes out significant. Okay. Um, so even though even though we like our sample sizes large, it has to be balanced with cost and time considerations. And we have to think about our sampling technique. Okay, the sample size and the sampling technique are connected. So we talked a little bit about threats to, or the, about external validity. Let's just return to that real briefly and talk about some threats. Um, can the results be generalized to other people, places, and time periods? That's what you're always thinking about. Remember, random selection will help your external validity. Okay. So 
How do you improve this external validity since those are some threats? You can do a good job of drawing a sample from a population by using random selection. You can use proximal similarity effectively, like we were talking about before, being just very thoughtful about who you can generalize to and who you can't. And replication, when a study is repeated with a different group of people in a different place at a different time, the results and the results of the study are similar external validity is increased, right? So if you run your same light therapy experiment in San Diego, California, and you find very, very similar results, wow, that really helps your external validity. So we definitely, in our field, like to rely on replication. All right, so now I'm just going to pause for a second and then come back and talk about randomized clinical trials. All right, I'm back. Let's continue our discussion, except let's turn now to randomized clinical trials. Um, I just wanna point out that I'm using a particular um, slide set here that um, I had obtained that I think is, it's freely available and it, it is really um, nice for this purpose of talking through randomized clinical trials. Okay, okay so, um, what is an observational study? It's when the investigators use the data observed in the population to make inference on the relationship between the variables. Whereas an experimental study is the investigators intervene in the natural history by actively altering one of the variables and then making inference on the relationship between the variables based on the outcomes. Okay. So one is you're observing what's going on. You're observing a relationship between two variables. In the other, you're actually intervening. And then you're observing what's going on between the two variables. Okay. Um, here's a historical example of an experimental study from James Lind back in the 1700s. And it has to do about the treatment of scurvy. On the 20th of May, 1747, I took 12 patients in the scurvy on board the Salisbury at sea. Their cases were as similar as I could have them. They all in general had putrid gums, the spots in lassitude, with weakness in the knees. They lay together in one place being a proper apartment for the sick in the forehold and had one dye in common to all. Two of these were ordered each a quart of cider a day Two others took 25 guts of elixir vitriol three times a day, and so on. They continued but six days under this course, and the consequence was that the most sudden visible good effects were perceived from the use of oranges and lemons. One of those who had taken them being at the end of six days fit for duty. Okay, so you can see how this is an experiment, right? Because there was an intervention done having them each alter what they were taking in a given day to try and see if it had an impact on the scurvy. Okay. So what might comparison groups in an experimental study be? It could be therapy versus no therapy, therapy A versus therapy B, therapy versus placebo, or sham. So placebo, I'm guessing, is relatively familiar, right? Like the idea of... Um, giving uh, something that may have no effect on the results, such as a sugar pill or something like that. Sham often occurs more in surgeries. Um, so sometimes if a surgery is the treatment of choice that you're, that you're examining, well, if you don't do something to the control group, they're gonna know they're in the control group. And if you're trying to keep it blind, sometimes sham surgeries are done where they don't actually, they open, they do a surgery, but they don't do the treatment. Um, so that's something, that's an interesting idea, and that is sometimes done. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about randomization. So R.A. Fisher first developed the concept of experimental randomization in 1925. J.B. Amberson and B.T. McMahon in 1931 randomized patients by using a coin flip to see who received treatment for tuberculosis. And Sir Austin Bradford Hill introduced the use of random numbers in the allocation of patients in the study of streptomycin and tuberculosis.
The 24 tuberculosis patients were then divided into two approximately comparable groups of 12 each. The cases were individually matched one with another in making this division. Then by a flip of the coin, one group became identified as group one, the treated group, and the other group as group two, the control group. The members of the separate groups were known only to the nurse in charge of the ward and to two of us. The patients themselves were not aware of any distinctions in the treatment administered. Okay. This is Amberson. Okay. Randomization. Randomization is the process by which allocation of subjects to treatment groups is done by chance without the ability to predict who is in what group. Okay. So, um, what you want to do basically with random assignment is ensure that every member has an equal chance of being assigned to any group. When you actually equate groups of participants, you're not eliminating extraneous variables, you're randomly distributing them across the groups. At least that's what you hope you're doing. Again, this is a probability exercise. This is known as a control technique and it is the most important and powerful control technique random assignment. So whereas we talked about random selection having a lot of impact on external validity, random assignment has a lot of impact on internal validity. So let's break down what a randomized clinical trial is. So a trial is an experiment. A clinical trial is a controlled experiment having a clinical event as an outcome measure done in a clinical setting typically and involving persons having a specific disease or health condition. A randomized clinical trial is a clinical trial in which participants are randomly assigned to separate groups that compare different treatments. All right, so let's take um, a look at how we might design a randomized clinical trial. We start off with our defined population. We randomize, some get the new treatment, some get the current treatment, and we see how many improve and do not improve in each group. Okay, so how do we randomize? Well, um, I'll show you a little bit more on the next page, but this is what a table of random numbers might look like. Okay, let me show you a little more on this next slide. Okay, so here's how you might do it. Let's say we're gonna use a one digit random number. And if two treatment groups are being studied, maybe we'll do if the first digit is zero to four, then we try go to treatment A. If the digit is five to nine, they go to treatment B. And you could see B for six, A for one, A for one, A for four, B for seven, et cetera, et cetera. And if three treatment groups are being studied, you can do one to three, four to six, seven to nine, and we can ignore the zeros, right? So this person gets ignored. They don't get into the study. Um, so other sources of random numbers other than random number tables, and I, I don't really use random number tables, they're okay, but they're, you know, they're, um, they're more, um, uh, common ways of doing this these days, such as computers or calculators, pseudo random numbers that are based on a mathematical formula or predetermined list, or what's even better are random numbered websites such as random.org. These are true random numbers based on true randomness, entropy outside of the computer, such as time to radioactive decay or atmospheric noise from radio. Um, so bottom line, if you need to do a random number scheme, I would suggest using random.org. It has a lot of free options in there that you can use to assign. Okay. okay. Um, so what's the purpose of randomization? Well, you're trying to prevent bias in allocating subjects to treatment groups. And you're also trying to achieve comparability between the groups, but there's no guarantee. And we'll talk more about this and how maybe you can help there be more of a guarantee. 
Now, randomized trials are considered a gold standard of study design because the potential for bias hopefully is avoided, right? At least the main variable on which you're separating is avoided, but you know, you, you could wind up um, having things that aren't as random, uh, aren't as equal as you might hope across your groups. Okay. So let's look at a non-randomized observational study. A comparative study of an intervention in two groups of patients with myocardial infarction shows that the mortality between the two groups differs. Okay. So in our one group, in each group we have a thousand people, people who happened to get the intervention, people who did not happen to get the intervention. In this group, 180 or 18 percent died. In this group, 300 or 30 percent died. What conclusion can we reach? Well, the intervention might have been helpful, but it could be that those who could get their hands on the intervention or those who volunteered for the intervention or what have you might also might also um, be those who were following other regiments to help them out, to help their health. Right? So maybe these people also changed their diet. We don't know. Okay. So now let's look at this. This is interesting. Let's, again, we have our observational study. And what do we find out if we dig a little deeper? We, dig that, we find out that the proportion of pace, patients with arrhythmia X in the two groups differ. So 800 here of the 1,000 had X minus and 200 had X plus, whereas here in the no intervention group, it was 500 and 500. So if we look at the percentages who die, 10% of the 800 or 80 pass, 50% of the 200 or 100 pass, 10%, 50%. These are the same. So really the intervention had nothing to do with it. It was all about arrhythmia X. Now, if on the other hand, we do a randomized control trial where we randomly split people into our intervention and no intervention groups, the arrhythmia X minus and X plus are likely to be similar across the groups. And then we see if they are, there's no effect of the intervention. But I just want to point out that I say likely, not guaranteed, just likely to be similar. In fact, proportions of patients with arrhythmia X in the two groups may differ. The similarity is not guaranteed. The similarity is not guaranteed. as you can see here, 800, 200, 500, 500. Okay. Okay, so not guaranteed. Okay. So how can we help things go in our favor? We can use something called matching which are techniques to equate participants in the treatment groups on a specific variable like arrhythmia X would be a perfect example, right? We could choose, to, if we thought arrhythmia X was such an important factor here, we might choose to equate our groups on arrhythmia X. We might also choose to equate our groups on intelligence, on age, on gender, what have you. And it controls for the variables on which participants are matched. Now it doesn't control for any other variables, just on the ones on which they are matched. So what are some matching techniques? You can hold the variables constant, right? Maybe I only take those people with arrhythmia X plus into my study. Maybe I only look at females. I can build the extraneous variable into the research design using blocking. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, I make the extraneous variable another IV in the study. 
So as opposed to maybe running an ANOVA, I'm running an ANCOVA by including that, okay? Now here's one that's a little different. It's called a yoked control, and it matches participants on the basis of the temporal sequence of administering an event. So let me give you an example of this one, okay? So imagine that you want to see if among seven, uh, yeah, try that again, if among second grade students, choosing when they get their snack will positively impact academic performance. So I have two classrooms, each has 20 students. In classroom A, the 20 students will get to choose when they have their snack. In classroom B, they will not get to choose when they have their snack. And again, we'll measure the DV of academic performance later on. So now let's break this down. Let's say person one in classroom A chooses to have his snack at 10.30 a.m. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take one person in classroom B and say, you will have your snack at 10.30 a.m. Note that the person B did not get to choose when he or she had their snack, but they were assigned at 10.30 a.m. because someone in person, because the corresponding person that they were matched to in classroom A got their snack at 10.30. Let's just go through one more example. So again, person two chooses to have their snack at 2 p.m. The corresponding person two in classroom B is assigned to have their snack at 2 p.m. That's a yoked control. And then there's matching by equating participants, individual matching, match case by case, then randomly assigned to groups. So I'm gonna show you an example of that. Okay. So here's an individual matching example. We have these different people with these different IQs. We have Sarah, Jane, Donald, Debbie, Jake, Jody, Kathy, Brian. Okay, so lo and behold, Sarah has 110 and we have Brian with 110. So we take Sarah and Brian, we match them. And then we say, we randomly choose which one is treatment and which one's control. So Sarah became control, Brian became treatment. Then Jane has 95, Kathy has 95. We randomly assign those to the true groups and Jane gets treatment and Kathy gets control and so on and so forth. Now, isn't it lovely how these people all had a corresponding matching IQ right there? As you might imagine, if you were actually trying to do this, this might be a real challenge to individually match. Maybe you wouldn't match on an exact IQ, maybe you'd ma match on a range or something like that. But the more variables that you choose to individually match on, the harder it gets. So matching is great, but it can be challenging too, depending on your sample size. But we matched and now we are guaranteed that our treatment and control groups have similar IQs. Had we simply divided them, randomly assigned them to groups, it might have worked out this way, it might not have. It probably would have worked out pretty well, but no guarantee. Okay. Then there's stratified randomization, which is random assignment within groups defined by participant characteristics such as age or disease severity, intended to ensure good balance of these factors across intervention groups. Let's take a look at how this works. Okay, so follow along with this. Thousand patients, right? 600 males, 400 females. That's all we have in terms of our description here. Uh, and then for age, we are just gonna divide into younger and older. Um, so we have 360 young, 240 old, and then for the females, 300 young and 100 old. So what we do is from each group down here, right? This is 360 young males. I take 180, put them into the treatment group and do it randomly, of course. Um, and 180 randomly go to the control group or current treatment group, excuse me. 240, I take 120, put them into the new treatment, 120 current treatment. I'm gonna take 
split this group, 150 into the new treatment, 150 into the current treatment. And finally, my group of 100, 50 into the new treatment, 50 into the current treatment. Okay, that's stratified randomization. Okay, when you do data collection and documentation, you always want to take a look at what was the assigned treatment and what was the received treatment. And you might assume that those are always the same, but it's not. It's not necessarily, and we'll talk more about that. Um, outcomes, what were the beneficial, what were the adverse effects? What was their prognos prognostic profile of entry into the, into the trial? And um, what was the randomization procedure sequence? How did you generate the random allocation? How did you implement the random allocation? And who actually generated the allocation sequence and role participants and assigned participants to groups? You want to just note all this um, to ensure that there was not any problem in the process. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about masking or blinding. Masking or blinding is used to increase the objectivity of the persons dealing with the randomized study to prevent prejudice. So you can blind the participants, of course, but you can also blind people who are giving the treatment, the data collectors, the data analysts, the investigators. So you can do any level of blinding uh, really that you wish. So you can have a non-blinded study or a single blinded, maybe just the participants are blinded. A double blinded study where the participants are blinded as well as the, the people giving the treatment. Or maybe even a triple blinded study where the participants, the treaters, and the data analysts are all blind. Okay. So placebo, as you know, is a medical treatment that is administered as if it were therapy but has no therapeutic value. Um, whereas a nocebo is a treatment like a placebo, but actually has a harmful result. Um, I, I don't think that term is nearly as common as the placebo, but it's good to know. Okay. So let's talk about placebo and blinding. Um, so let's look at this little study here. We have the results of a questionnaire on a prophylactic drug ingested by each uh, volunteer. So we have vitamin C as the actual drug, placebo. And here's our matches. 40 people who got vitamin C suspected they got vitamin C and 39 who, who got placebo suspected they got placebo. 12 who got vitamin C thought they got placebo and 11 who got vitamin C thought they got, who got placebo thought they got vitamin C, excuse me. And then this was the group of unknowns. So, um, I guess the point here is that it's important sometimes to assess not only um, what they were given, but what they were suspected that they were given, because that could influence the results. Okay, so placebo and side effects. Um, this is another interesting piece right here. This is from the Women's Health Study, and we can see um, that there, there were significant differences in, in different side effects across these groups, but note that these were not zero. These, these were still given placebos and you still had a fair number of them who were, who were claiming these symptoms. And any report of gastric upset is the same. I mean, it's not statistically different, let's say, than the aspirin. So that's pretty interesting. Okay. So I said before that the treatment that is assigned is not always the treatment that is received. And here's why it has to do, here's at least one reason why it has to do with compliance. Compliance is the willingness of the participants to carry out the procedures according to the established protocols, how, how well they comply with the study, right? So you can have dropouts who are the participants who do not adhere to the experimental regimen during follow-up. All right, they drop out of the study. You're familiar with that. You can also have drop-ins, participants who did not adhere to the control regimen during follow-up. So uh, let's look at non-adherence during follow-up. We have an NSAID, um, non-steroidal um, 
anti-inflammatory, okay. and we have a placebo. Um, this is the group in here who decide that they can't tolerate the NSAID and drop out. This is the group who, who re either require an NSAID or take it on their own and drop into this group. So how are you gonna deal with this in data analysis? That's kind of an interesting question. Um, you can look at intention to treat. You can analyze according to the original allocation. And you're basically trying to understand based on the original allocation, what, what seemed to be going on. You can look at the actual treatment received based on the observed data. Okay. Um, and the problem with that, of course, is that you've lost the benefit of randomization. All right, so let's look a little further. Let's look at this kind of subgroup analysis here. Um, so we've got this number of patients who got clofibrate, this number of patients who got placebo, and look at the five-year mortality. Now, suddenly let's look at the compliance. Oh, well, these people who got the clofibrate were poor compliers and they had a much higher mortality rate or, you know, we don't know significance, but it looks higher than this number of good compliers. So maybe those who actually were good compliers did better than the placebo. Hmm, let's look further. Now we're gonna break out the placebo into poor compliers and good compliers, right? So a poor complier on the placebo probably went ahead and got the clofibrate. Good complier stayed on their placebo. And if we look at it this way, what do you notice? It seems like the mortality had more to do with compliance than anything else at least if we just look at this data. Okay. So how do you deal with non-compliance? It's a toughie uh, and it depends on your kind of study. It, it can be super tough. You can monitor compliance by observing the treatment directly. You can count pills. You can conduct blood or urine tests to confirm compliance. And another cool technique is the use of what's called a run-in period. So let's talk about the run-in period a little bit. Okay, so this is a, um, the physician's health study. So there were 33,223 willing and eligible physicians who were enrolled in a run-in phase during which all received active aspirin and placebo beta carotene. After 18 weeks, participants were sent a questionnaire asking about their health status, side effects, compliance, and willingness to continue in the trial. A total of 11,152, right? So about a third, changed their minds, reported a reason for exclusion, or did not reliably take the study pills. The remaining 22,071 physicians were then randomly assigned. I'm trying to decide if, I, if this study is familiar to you or not, um, but there is actually a big problem in the study. Um, it'll come up in a later slide, but you can kind of think about it in the meantime, what might have been a problem when they were looking at these 22,071 physicians. And this was a few decades, uh, at, least, at least four or five decades back, maybe more. Okay. Do you know any about any RCTs to provide evidence that we should use RCTs? Um, now, I only mention this, I only offer this little cartoon slide to kind of poke fun just a little bit at RCTs. They are very good, um, but they're not the only game in town. And so uh, if you're not doing an RCT, I think you, you need not feel bad about that. Um, they have a lot of nice features to them, but they don't work for everything. Okay. Okay, so now let's talk about some randomized trial study designs. 
let's consider a parallel treatment or simple non-crossover, a planned crossover, an unplanned crossover, and a factorial. Okay, so here's our good old parallel treatment. We have our study population, we randomize, we choose our, our sample and we randomize to, to A, to B, and we look at outcomes. For example, the hypertension detection and follow-up program, we have an elevated DBP, successfully randomize um, close to 11,000 into step care and referred care. And we look at mortality rates later on, five years later. Okay. Um, and here's some interesting results of this. We see the percent mortality reduction in our stepped care group being particularly high uh, when the diastolic blood pressure is lower than when it's higher, but still looks interesting, looks something worth looking into a bit more, right? Okay. Maybe stepped care is helpful. So now I want you to look at this planned crossover trial. So here's the way this works. There's a new treatment and a current treatment. We assign people to group one or group two. We observe them. Then we switch it up, okay? We take group one and give them the current treatment and group two and give them the new treatment. Okay, so there's a lot of ways to, um, to think about this planned crossover trial. Um, sometimes it's done a little differently and we have what's called a weightless control where um, only one of these groups have moved. So the weightless control would be when group two, after they've gone through most of the phases of the trial would be moved over to the new treatment, especially if it was deemed effective. But in this one, we're moving both groups. Okay, so it's an interesting way to think about a study. And then here's the unplanned crossover trial. And this, this relates back to the dropouts and drop-ins we talked about before. We have some people assigned to surgical care, some people assigned to medical care. And then we have within the surgical care group, those who are randomly assigned, we have some who refuse surgery. And so drop over to the no surgery or medical care group. They drop out. These people require surgery and they drop in to surgery. So the refuse surgery, drop out, the require surgery, drop in. Okay. I mean, that's one way to think of it, okay. Um, so here's a factorial design trial. Um, this one, you have treatment A. Some people only get A. Some people only get B. Some people get neither. Some people get both. So what's kind of cool about this is we can look at the study of treatment A by looking at those who got A or both A and B. We can look at also the study of treatment B by looking at those who got B or both A and B. Okay, so um, this brings us back to the physician's health study. Does aspirin prevent first myocardial infarction? And does beta carotene prevent cancer? So we had 22,071 physicians, 40 to 84 years old. This was back in 1982, assigned to one of four groups, aspirin only, beta carotene only, aspirin and beta carotene, neither. So if they're in the aspirin only group, they got a beta carotene placebo, right? And if they're in the beta carotene group, they got the aspirin placebo. If they got both, they got both. And if they got neither, they got two placebos, okay. So here's our layout. We have our group who just got the aspirin plus for aspirin. We have the group who just got the beta carotene plus for beta carotene. We have the group that got both plus for both and the group that got neither minus for both. Randomized aspirin component terminated early on January 25th, 1988 with a positive effect of 44% reduction in risk of myocardial infarction. So um, the reason they ended the study is because it was so effective. 
So they, they wanted to let everyone know to start taking your aspirin. Now the beta carotene component continued as scheduled and terminated in December 31st, 1995 and produced neither benefit nor harm for cancer. Have you figured out the problem yet? 1982, all physician study. There's probably a number of problems, but we'll talk about it in a minute. Okay, so efficacy is the reduction in risk. Efficacy is the, you can calculate it by getting the rate in the placebo minus the rate in the treated over the rate in the placebo. Or one minus rate in treated over rate in placebo. Okay. All right. So let's turn our attention to, oh, um, I think we're going to come back one more time to this study, but just in case we don't, um, I'll tell you what the problem is. It was all males. All the physicians were males. So I think we are going to talk a little bit more about this later, though. Okay, internal external validity in a randomized trial. Okay, so this is what I was talking about before. How you choose your study population from your reference population, that's all about external validity and generalizability. How you randomize into the new and current treatment or the treatment in placebo or whatever it is, that's internal validity. So if you want to increase your external validity, try random selection. If you want to increase your internal validity, try random assignment. External validity, random selection. Internal validity, random assignment. Okay. Oh, so here we go. We are back to the study. Okay, so external validity, generalizability from the physician's health study. Aspirin reduced the risk of myocardial infarction, reduction in risk of 44% in men 50 years or older who did not have clinical evidence of coronary disease. Can the findings be generalized to women? So there was a women's health study. Aspirin had no significant effect on the risk of myocardial infarction in women 65 years or older who did not have a history of cardiovascular disease. Interesting, right? So this is a great example of where external validity has to be, uh, you know, carefully monitored, right? Across, so we took this wonderful study of 22,000 people. We would love to be able to generalize it out to different groups of people. Um, I would say, we don't even know if we can generalize it to non-physicians, let alone people who are not men. And you can see the problem. Okay. So some ethical issues in randomized clinical trials, since we were talking about, about ethics last week, is randomization ethical? I mean, is it okay to give some people a placebo and some people a uh, control or some people even a I mean, placebo and experiment, uh, experimental treatment. Is it even okay to do a new treatment and current treatment? Can truly informed consent be obtained? I mean, and in a way, how can it if you're keeping the participants blind and they might know they may not get the, the treatment, they may get the placebo or they may get the current treatment as opposed to the new treatment, but is it, I mean, especially depending on um, what the disease is and, you know, if someone's looking at a, um, if they're, if they have cancer, they're being given a new type of treatment, they might be feeling somewhat desperate to, to take it, even knowing that they may not get it. When can a placebo be used? Under what circumstances? when we don't already have an established treatment? Under what conditions should a randomized clinical trial be stopped earlier than originally planned, right? I mean, I think we might agree that if it, it either goes really, really well or really, really poorly, we might stop it earlier than planned. But uh, where, when? Okay. Okay, so this is our last slide, and this comes back to that homework. So remember to read the article um, that I posted on slide one, and then I want you to address these questions. You're evaluating the participant section. 
is the sample size adequate to find the effect? Are power analyses mentioned? What sampling technique was used? Are the participants representative of the theoretical and or study populations? Were, where were the participants obtained from and are they a biased sample? If, it's, if this is an experimental design, was true random assignment done using a random number generator or something else that would give you true random assignment? Are there equal number of males and females and are there a range of socioeconomic strata and ethnicities? Stuff to think about and explore as you read through the participant section of that article, okay? Um, so in terms of the rest of the article, in case you're wondering, um, it, it might be useful to look at some of the other parts to help you out with this, um, but it's primarily the participant section that you're looking at, okay? Okay. All right, that is all I have for you for now. So stay safe, be well, and I'll see you soon.